So today we have Andrew Harter from University of Tokyo. I'm not quite sure if that is a correct statement to make now. You correct me. Yeah. Uh, I moved, moved to a new position, okay. uh, but uh, this is all work done uh, at University of Tokyo. Okay. You just keep going when you're ready. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Andrew Harder, and my talk is going to be about floquet driving of PT symmetric lattices. And like I said, this work was done at the uh, University of Tokyo uh, at the Institute of Industrial Science, and it was sponsored by uh, JSPS. Oh no, I can't change the slide. Um, uh -huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, so I uh, recently moved from Tokyo, but I used to live in Tokyo, not as close as these pictures show, uh, actually much further away. Um, and, and I was doing work uh, at the Hatano lab under Naomishi Hatano, um, who I'm sure you all know very well. And, um, Yes, one thing that I would like to highlight that I did while I was there is that I climbed to the top of Mount Fuji, which is uh, blown up in this picture. Um, you can see the picture from the top on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, that's the sunrise. So that was a really fun thing to do, but I also did a lot of um, physics work with uh, Naomishi. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. <clears throat> Um, so the outline of my talk is, uh, gonna, that it's going to have three parts. Uh, in the first part, I'm just going to talk about a simple two site PT symmetric system that's driven in time and the ways that that can be analyzed, um, and various types of driving, uh, periodic driving specifically. And uh, I'll conclude with a um, small experiment that was done actually a, a while ago now, but um, kind of uh, to wrap up part one. And for part two, um, I'm going to connect all the cases that I talked about in part one with a parameterization. Um, and I'll talk about some limiting cases and um, ways that we can really uh, explore the phase diagrams of those systems. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about um, non-Hermitian topological systems, which is um, a very big subject. So I'm just going to focus on a few things that I've done um, in that uh, category. And um, just to talk about some uh, applications, again, to the temporal driving of systems like that. Okay, so uh, I'm sure everyone knows uh, about PT symmetry breaking because that's uh, one of the primary topics of this seminar. And um, we all know you, have, you can have the simplest uh, PT symmetric system. It's a non-Hermitian system. It has gain and loss, uh, which we call it. We always color the gain red and the loss blue. And um, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, I have a very simple schematic of that system. Um, and we know that the eigenvalues can be real up to a critical point uh, of the gain and loss. And above that point, they become imaginary complex conjugates. And of course, due to the antilinearity of the PT operator, uh, the eigenstates, uh, the energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are not shared with the PT operator anymore. And um, this is all kind of the very basic stuff. Um, so what about uh, external driving of these systems? So in that case, uh, the energy is no longer a static quantity. It changes with time. The Hamiltonian changes with time. So um, if we want to talk about PT symmetry breaking, uh, we typically say, when do the energy eigenvalues become complex? But in this case, 
uh, if you have temporal driving, they may be complex at one time and they may be real at another time. So it's kind of like a question of what wins out. Um, you can imagine if they're mostly complex most of the time, then uh, the, the behavior of PT broken symmetry will win out. And if they're almost never imaginary, maybe the behavior of the uh, PT symmetric system will uh, win out or unbroken PT symmetry. And um, so I think something to consider there is that you cannot just analyze it at one point, static point in time. You have to think about the whole time evolution. Um, so we could think about an driving, just a generic driving of a system, and that would require us to think about an infinite amount of time. Or we can restrict ourselves to periodic driving. And in that case, we can just analyze the behavior of one period. And um, the simplest thing to do is to just do a simple modulation between one state, one, one Hamiltonian uh, for a half of a period, and then switch to another Hamiltonian for the second half of the period. Um, so it's kind of a pulsed driving. Um, so I have a picture here in the bottom of the slide of two different types of driving. One would be driving of the gain and loss. Um, and in, in the picture I've shown, uh, the value of the coupling is higher than the value of the gain and loss. And so uh, the system <clears throat> will be uh, modulating between a PT symmetric system and a Hermitian system when gamma goes to zero. But it will always be, if we think about this from the static point of view, it will always be in the unbroken phase. Um, are, are you intending that gamma and J always stay real? Gamma and J, yes, sorry. I should say, yeah, gamma and J are real parameters. The only imaginary part is explicit in the I that I wrote in the Hamilton. I'm sorry, I don't have a cursor here. I don't think you guys can see my cursor um, and I couldn't figure out how to get that to work. So I'll have to describe in words where I'm talking about. Um, in the- Andrew, Andrew, perhaps yeah. you press C? C. For the cursor? Yeah. Can you see it now? Maybe. No. No? No, I don't see it. Sorry. Uh, Maybe not. Yeah, I don't no. I don't know. Okay. I, that okay. used to work before, but for some reason now it stopped working. So I apologize. Uh I'll have to just make sure. Let me know if it's confusing where I'm talking about. Um so on the right hand picture at the bottom uh i'm talking i'm showing a picture where we're modulating the coupling rather than the uh gain and loss parameter so in that case uh when the coupling goes to zero obviously the system for any non-zero value of gamma uh becomes broken or pt symmetry broken so we would be modulating between um, a PT symmetric case or the blue part of that curve and uh, a PT broken case in the red part. And so that's kind of going back and forth between PT symmetric and PT broken. <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you redefine gamma zero, please? Ah, sorry, that this is just the gamma zero corresponds directly to just gamma in the in the picture in the Hamiltonian I showed in the upper right, except for we're modulating um, gamma zero would just be a particular value of, of gamma basically. So in the left-hand side, uh, you can think about the Hamiltonian, the time dependent Hamiltonian as changing between gamma equals gamma zero and gamma equals zero. And on the right-hand side, we would keep gamma static at exactly equal to gamma naught, and we would be changing J. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. 
I think it'll be a little bit clearer in a minute here. Um, so we can analyze these types of systems with uh, the flow K theorem, which is basically the same thing, the same way we analyze, um, you know, spatially periodic systems with uh, block theory, block theorem, um, the same type of thing here. Um, we can express the, the goal is to express the time evolution of the system in terms of two operators. This, so if I call G, that's the time evolution of the system, we can express it as uh, the product of P, which is another time dependent operator, and this exponential factor, which looks like the typical static evolution of a Hamiltonian, which I've called HF, the flow K Hamiltonian. And that's a static quantity or a static operator. And this P operator has the uh, property that it is periodic in time. So, and initially it's equal to the identity. So we can actually solve for the flow K Hamiltonian by analyzing the system over, or the evolution over one period and setting it equal to um, E to the minus I times the flow K Hamiltonian times the time of one period. Uh, and so that's the equation on the upper right. That's a time ordered product. Um, so what you end up with is that by just integrating the Hamiltonian over one period, the time dependent Hamiltonian, you can find an equivalent uh, static Hamiltonian uh, that kind of acts like, or it kind of behaves like the, um, effective Hamiltonian for that period. And then the uh, only other factor is this P operator, which is periodic. So all of the long-term behavior is contained just in the HF or the flow K Hamiltonian. So if we analyze the eigenvalues of the flow K Hamiltonian, that will, if they're complex, we'll know the long-term behavior uh, will have this exponential growth and decay, just like the static PT symmetric case. And if it does not, then we'll know that because the other operator that it gets multiplied by is periodic. And, and since the behavior of that operator, uh, the e to the minus IHFT will also be periodic, we would have a stable periodic behavior. Can I ask so, you? Um, sure. In, in what, which space are you actually evolving? Would you not have to construct a metric? which potentially sure. could be time dependent and that's difficult to do. Well, I guess in this space, I'm just evolving in the original, uh, in the um, original space that we would have evolved in the static space. So you, even we're not there, changing we the, the definition of the space. Even there, you need a different metric. Do you need what? A metric. You mean like uh, inner product? Yes. So I'm using, so any metric that I would use here is just going to be the same uh, metric that I would use for the static case. So just using the left and right eigenvectors and mm. defining the inner product that way. But yeah, I mean, that inner product could be time dependent. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, complete outsider here. I've got a periodically driven Hamiltonian H. Yeah. And you've constructed a function called G of T. Yeah. What do I, what, what relevance is that to H of T? So that is the time evolution of the system. Or that is the operator that you would multiply by the, um, by the um, initial state, for instance, to get the time dependence of that state. H1 and H2 are not time dependent? Right, so I haven't got to that yet. I'm still at this top line, but um, okay. yeah, H1 and H2 are just going to be two static Hamiltonians, just generically. So it's something like the interaction picture. No, yeah. 
Well, Andrew, you, you just wrote it. G of capital T is the time order product. Uh, so you, instead yeah. of putting T, you just put a small T. So that, that, that's just a time evolution operator. Yeah, so oh. it's just the time evolution operator. Okay. Just the, the, everything I'm saying so far, except for, I guess, this P operator and the Floquet uh, Hamiltonian uh, oh, is just okay. normal, like the standard way of analyzing a time dependent problem. Okay. I think what you got is that G of capital T is that integral from zero to T of H of little t, yeah. where H of T equals zero is H1, and H of T equals capital T is H2. The, um, is that what you mean? Well, I, I think in in that in that first case is just any periodic Hamiltonian. No, I think I mean, the first line. I think the first line only summarizes the Floquet theorem. Yes, okay. that's all. Is I'm just saying that's what the Floquet theorem is. No, I understand that. What I'm asking is, does the thing in the blue box represent no. the application of the Floquet theorem to a Hamiltonian that is equal to h1 at the initial time and h2 at the final time? No. Um, yes. So I would say it's h1 for half a period and h2 uh, for the other half. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, so yeah, moving down from that first line, I call this driving between just two static Hamiltonians as a two-step driving. So you have half a period with H1 and the other half with H2. And in that case, obviously this uh, Floquet thing, stuff at the top drastically simplifies and just becomes the, the uh, what's shown in the blue box here the product of the time evolution of the second times the time evolution of the first for each for a half a period. And we can just directly set that equal to the uh, equivalent evolution over a full period of the Floquet Hamiltonian. So hopefully I've cleared that up about uh, what's happening here on this slide. Um, so, um, as I said before, we want to analyze this Floquet Hamiltonian uh, to see what the long-term behavior of a system that evolves this way would be. Um, and we'll, I'll say that the system behaves like a PT broken one when there are imaginary eigenvalues in the Floquet Hamiltonian, HF. So basically this HF is like, looks like the static, we treat it like a static Hamiltonian but it's really an effective Hamiltonian. So uh, here on this slide, I've shown um, those two types of modulation, uh, the two-step modulation. One is varying the gain and loss as a step function, and the other is varying, varying the coupling as a step function. And what I'm showing here in these plots is the um, is the maximum imaginary eigenvalue um, of the Floquet Hamiltonian. So you can see there's this really uh, rich behavior where it's dark blue, that behaves like a PT unbroken system, and we don't have this imaginary eigenvalues and exponentially uh, increasing behavior, but in a, where the color changes from blue and goes towards yellow, uh, that is where the system behaves like a PT or a PT broken one. So in those cases, you have um, this uh, unstable behavior where your uh, eigenvalues are getting, the imaginary part is getting larger and larger and larger. And um, you can see that varying the gain and loss um, if we were to, if you look at the vertical axis of these plots, the vertical axis is the gain and loss value compared to the coupling, and the horizontal axis is the frequency at which the loss is varied. And, you know, normally if this was a static system, uh, the PT breaking point would just be when gamma naught equals J. So, 
we can see that we have way different behavior from that. They're depending on the value of the uh, driving frequency, we have different areas that extend deeply into what would normally be the statically broken uh, regime. So far above gamma equals J, gamma not equals J. And uh, in other cases near these resonance points. So in this case, the resonance points that you can see are uh, omega equals to one and two, for instance, um, that the PT broken regime extends uh, all the way down to zero, vanishingly small width, but uh, all the way down. So uh, there's actually a lot of different, um, a very drastically different behavior compared to the static case. And we see a very similar thing, but a different picture when we vary the coupling uh, on the right-hand side. Um, and we see that the points, the resonance points where the PT broken phase comes down all the way to zero are in a different location. But again, they're there. And um, in both cases, we have this uh, phenomenon of the PT broken phase extending all the way down uh, to uh, any non-zero gamma, gamma naught. Okay. Sorry. Isn't that, isn't that uh, sort of what one would expect? I mean, if you're balancing something uh, like a broom upside down in your hand, you know, if you oscillate your hand back and forth, you can achieve stability, yeah. but you have to be very careful not to oscillate it at a resonant frequency, otherwise you lose that stability. And that's yeah. in effect what these graphs show. I mean, this, this is something that we already know about um, I mean, this is this is something familiar yeah. from a, a conventional Hermitian Hamiltonian. Yes, uh, and in fact, uh, that's a really <laughs> I like this uh, broom analogy. Um, the way I think of it for this two site system is, uh, if you start out with um, a state which is all uh, which is all located on the first site. Uh, it's going to couple back and forth between the sites with some frequency. Mm -hmm. And if you modulate the gain and loss just right, then every time that the majority of the probability of the state is on the other side, that's when um, you know the site, that's when you switch the gain and loss, then it always will see this sort of like uh, loss where you can balance it in such a way that it doesn't really see uh, so much gain, you know? So it kind of always might look to it like it's in a Hermitian case. So I don't know if that also helps explain it. Hmm. But again, it's very heavily dependent on the exact right frequency. So um, it's not just it's not just any old frequency that will uh, do that. By the way, I see that you noted uh, Jaclakar um, yeah. at the bottom of that slide. Um, he has found graphs. I mean, he's over the past few years when he's given talks, he has also shown graphs that are very similar to these. Um, yes, with the real and the the complex eigenvalues. Yes, those are. Those are the same graphs. So yep. uh, yeah, this is all just old news, essentially. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So, uh, and briefly, I just want to say, actually, with um, Jogikar and um, DeMello and Lou and Lee um, and I, we uh, analyzed, uh, they built a, an experiment uh, in Indianapolis to um, try to analyze, try to actually reproduce a system like this. And what they did is they uh, trapped non-interacting Fermi gas of lithium six atoms into their two lowest hyperfine states, and then coupling them with a RF field so that they go just between those two states and they're in the trap. 
And then by shining an optical beam onto the trap, uh, it actually couples states out of the trap. So that can act like a loss for that system. Uh, and because that optical beam is able to be turned on and off in time, um, and also the RF field, which is generating the uh, coupling between the two hyperfine states, uh, because of that, we can control this system with basically a time-dependent coupling or a time-dependent uh, gain and loss, or just loss in this case. Um, and this is just sort of showing um, that they have good control over this system. So they have the scaled number of atoms on the vertical axis of both of these graphs. And on the horizontal axis um, is time. And you see that the uh, theory of what, this is just uh, for a static Hamiltonian. Uh, the theory of what should happen matches well with um, the uh, dots, which are the experiment. So um, what, what was done then in the experiment is to pulse, as I said, the gain and loss, um, which is exactly what I was talking about on the previous slides. And um, basically, we're just going between the, the Hamiltonian that I show on the left and the Hamiltonian that I show on the right. So on, in one case, it's a... Uh, kind of a lossy PT symmetric Hamiltonian in the other case is a completely Hermitian Hamiltonian. So um, those results um, let us scan over a range of frequencies. So on the left two graphs, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the frequency. And on the vertical axis of the graph, this is the same graph I showed in the previous um, slide or two slides before, um, we have the, uh, the value of the gain and loss. Um, and everything else is an experiment, uh, an experimental result. So on the right hand side, we have uh, two PT symmetric phase uh, time evolutions. And you see that the, the number of atoms in the trap is remaining roughly uh, constant over a period, or it's not really, it's just changing periodically over um, in time. And that's because those two blue uh, curve, those two blue curves uh, are corresponding to points that are taken in the PT symmetric phase of the uh, of this whole picture, so the blue the blue points correspond to what is in the lower left, either the blue circle or the blue diamond. So those two frequencies at that at the value of the gain and loss that we have correspond to PT symmetric behavior, uh, which is predicted by the theory. And similarly for the red, which is right in the middle of this. Uh, this kind of cone that's opening up from the uh, resonant frequency, you see that you have a PT broken phase. So the number of atoms is exponentially increasing. And actually, I should say this number of atoms is a scaled number of atoms, because of course, this is actually a lossy experiment. So basically, this is showing that experimentally, this can be done. And this allows us uh, to easily, in an experiment, just uh, scan over um, a range of frequencies, but keeping the loss low. And that's important because uh, if the loss is high, like if we were doing a static experiment, we would need the loss to be almost on the order of the coupling. And it would be very hard to observe things in the PT broken case then. But in this case, we can have a very low loss compared to the coupling. Uh, as you see, it, it's actually 0.2. Uh, and we can scan and enter the PT broken phase and actually come back out on the other side as we increase the coupling. So that's sort of the value of doing this. Um, and we did the same thing for coupling. Um, so here we're 
actually scanning everything in this red box. So this is the same PT phase diagram I showed for the coupling modulation. So this is turning on and off that RF field so that the coupling is either a value high above the, the uh, gain and loss rate or zero. So this is going between PT broken or PT unbroken to PT broken over one period. And uh, you can see again that the uh, experimental results match up pretty well with the uh, theoretical. And in these uh, three graphs here in the middle, we are scanning over uh, basically over exactly what this phase diagram is. So we're looking at the number of atoms that remain in the trap after a constant set time. And in the cases where it's PT broken, we expect that to be uh, a lot higher. And so those peaks exactly correspond to the, uh, the PT phase diagram or being in the broken phase in the PT uh, phase diagram. So you can see that as we increase gamma, uh, starting at the bottom, which is yellow at 0 0.095 of J um, and going all the way up to 0.21 J, which is these black dots, um, you can see the broadening of that PT broken region. And so that's um, really just verifying that this can be done experimentally and with uh, high quality. So uh, in the next section, I'm going to talk about connecting these uh, different. Um, yeah, go ahead. Are you able to set up a, an arrangement where you are neither Hermitian nor PT season? PT symmetric. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I guess, I mean, you just take ga gamma one uh, not equal to gamma two, for instance. Oh, I see what you mean. I, I can um, certainly do Hamiltonian, which is neither of them. I was just wondering whether you, you're able to explore it in any way. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, in reality, gamma one, uh, gamma one not equal to gamma two in that experiment would correspond to, um, I guess, different uh, maybe intensities of the pulse flashing, but I don't, we didn't do that in that experiment. Okay, no, but I, just, I think it certainly I could think be done. a way to visualize the difference between broken, uh, broken PT and just nothing, <laughs> neither, her, neither her mission nor PT. Ah, so, I mean, if you, you're saying that each, so in this two-step type of driving, each mm -hmm. Hamiltonian itself would have two different gains and losses? Yeah, or, or, yeah. or one, doesn't have to be both. So in that case, that would correspond to um, sort of some sort of like, well, I guess like in this, in the previous case, it was actually one site had no, no loss and the other site had only loss, right? Yeah. So I I think you would you could scale any system like that to one that kind of is like a PT system, right? Oh, okay. By uh, I mean, if I'm understanding what you're saying, we could just scale the system by the uh, average of the gain and losses. I don't you know if that shift, shift not scale shift. You just shift. Yeah. Just the shift. Sorry, not a scale, a shift, yeah. By like the adding an identity times the average or subtracting off an identity times the average of the two gains and losses. Which is exactly what we did in these cases, because they actually, you know, this lossy Hamiltonian is not actually PT symmetric uh, itself, but it uh, it shifts to one. So um, yeah, and maybe in this next slide, well, so so does that answer your question? Yeah, that's okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just kind of an overview of these different mod, uh, modulation types that, that I've discussed. So on the left, we have coupling modulation. So this is like going between H1 which has just uh, this PT symmetric 
um, form and H2, which is completely broken. There's no coupling at all. So that's the coupling modulation. So that's the left column. The PT to Hermitian modulation is the kind I was also just discussing, uh, which starts out in a PT symmetric Hamiltonian and the gain and loss go away in the second Hamiltonian and you just have uh, a normal Hermitian Hamiltonian. And then in the last case, uh, you reverse the gain and loss. So the gain becomes a loss and the loss becomes a gain. Uh, and each of the PT phase diagrams for each of these is uh, different. And I think that's kind of interesting that depending on the type of coupling, you get uh, these different places where there's the, the resonance occurs in different places. And you actually see also the uh, behavior at high values of gain and loss drastically being different between the three cases. And uh, one thing to think about when you look at these is that for the high frequency, when the frequency gets high enough, we can just think about the system should go to kind of the average of the Hamil two, two Hamiltonians. So uh, in the coupling modulation case, the system just goes to another PT symmetric Hamiltonian. So you do have, you see that in the uh, static phase diagram as omega increases, as the coupling frequency increases, the uh, it kind of goes to what you expect for a static, Hamil static PT symmetric Hamiltonian in that it doesn't depend on omega anymore. The phase doesn't depend on omega. It just depends on, on uh, gamma. And so there's just some static PT breaking point. Um, the same thing is true in the second one, but you can't see it in this picture. And then in the last one, the uh, gain and loss actually cancel each other out. So we expect that in the high frequency limit, uh, it will look like a static Hermitian Hamiltonian. So those three cases, I think, are kind of the uh, important ones. Um, so what we can do is parameterize um, our modulation by this parameter uh, mu. So what we're going to do is drive between a Hamiltonian with a gain and loss value gamma naught and another Hamiltonian with a gain and loss value mu gamma naught and will vary mu from minus one to one. And what that does is allow us to kind of access um, all three cases. A, well, it allows us to access the static case when mu is equal to one, because then the Hamiltonians that you drive between are the same. Uh, so looking at this kind of like top picture here, I have these two site uh, pictures like I had on my first slide, uh, just demonstrating what types of systems we're driving between. And so when you see when mu equals one, it's the same. So we expect that to be like a static uh, PT symmetric case. And when mu equals zero, that is corresponds to the PT to Hermitian driving. So the first case is PT symmetric and the second case is neutral. Uh, there's no gain and loss. And in the last case, this is the flipping of the gain and loss that I was describing. So mu equals minus one and the gain becomes a loss and the loss becomes a gain. Uh, but mu can take on any value between minus one and one. So actually in this box here in the bottom, I have the PT phase diagrams for different values of mu between uh, minus one and one uh, plotted. So in the first box, it's very near to static. And you see that really the, uh, you just start to see the formation of that uh, resonance just extending down. And as you go from point mu equals 0 0.9 to 0 0.7 to 0.5, you really start to see that form and the other uh, resonances, the sub below the primary resonance uh, start to come down. And then at zero, uh, all of those resonances are there, but also you see this um, 
that this uh, reg region, which is PT symmetric, extending upwards very far deeply into what is normally the static PT breaking regime. And uh, as we then decrease mu even further, um, you see that that comes back down uh, and the resonances kind of exchange so that by the time mu goes minus one, the resonances have uh, shifted in their location. But why are these cases mu equals 0.7 and mu o equals minus 0.7 not somehow symmetric in the picture? Because you, ex you exchange in the Hamiltonians only the uh, somehow the row one with the row two. You have here the pictures for 0.7 and 0.7. Yeah. And I would expect the same picture because you in your Hamiltonians you just extend, exchange the label one with label two, isn't it? Well, but they don't so commute. At, but H1 and H2 don't, don't commute. Right. So at, uh, at 0 0.7, the, yeah, they don't, so they don't commute. So you're talking about two different, uh, two different cases. So it's kind of, um, like I said, if at, at one and minus one, when H is one, then they do commute, right? Because they're the same Hamiltonian. And when, when mu is minus one, they don't commute because they're uh, the opposites of each other. Right, but if I take a Fourier transform of such a system, uh, I would expect somehow in the complex omega plane uh, in both cases to have the same Fourier transform. Hmm. Because somehow the two po uh, points in the omega plane where you have resonances or complex eigenvalues, they are just interchanged. That's true. Isn't that but... Fourier transform at the point where you switch H1 to H2? I mean, this is not a Fourier transform, but a Laplace transform, but anyway. Hmm. Well, I guess uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at doing any Fourier transform of this. I think this is all about the Floquet theorem. I mean, it, it, the Floquet theorem, I guess if you, from that standpoint, but uh, like with a complex omega, like you're saying, Um, yeah, I guess I don't. Your pictures you had before with your experiments, they look somehow like a Fourier transform of something where you are with real omega somehow. Hmm. I guess I'm not, <clears throat> I don't fully understand uh, what you're saying, but um, I guess that's something that I'd, I'd like to hear more about if we can uh, discuss after. Because I'm just here, I'm just plotting the, uh, I'm doing the same thing that I've done the whole time where I'm just plotting the PT phase diagram with a real frequency and a real uh, gain and loss parameter. And I'm just changing the, just changing the second Hamiltonian between various different cases. I think the answer to Frieda is that the Fourier transform you want is of e to the i h1 t over 2, e to the i h2 t over 2, and not the Fourier transform of e to the i of h1 plus h2. And I think that what, what Frieda is, is what referring you're to saying? the Fourier transform of e to the i h1 plus h2 times t. And well, I think not, we, we uh, have to calculate it by hand, then <laughs> we will see. Yes, but that's not the case that's being discussed here. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, we might be talking about a slightly different thing, but um, 
yeah, maybe we can discuss later. Um, anyhow, so the important thing here is that uh, you see this changing behavior in uh, the resonances. So you'll notice that uh, when mu is positive, um, you don't have any, um, or you have resonance at, uh, you can see like two and one, and actually it's uh, two over um, three, so two thirds and so on. And when mu becomes negative, you actually get this, um, it's kind of hard to show without the cursor, but you get uh, a different resonances. So you see that you maybe still have the resonance at one, but it's kind of maybe disappearing. And um, the other resonance becomes the second primary resonance. So that by the time it becomes minus one, that resonance that used to be at one has disappeared. So that's kind of the uh, interesting thing here is the changing in the resonance locations. Um, so you can obviously easily calculate that um, time evolution operator that I discussed earlier for these cases. Um, it looks like a long expression here, but it's actually uh, fairly straightforward. Um, because it's just a multiplication of two uh, two exponents of the two exponentiating operators. And um, we're looking for what is the effective Floquet Hamiltonian. So if we do e to the minus i uh, times the first order, I guess second Hamiltonian times what I'm calling tau, which is just the period over two times e to the minus i times the second Hamiltonian times tau, that should equal e to the minus 2i times the Floquet Hamiltonian times tau, because 2 tau is the full period. And uh, by doing this, we arrive at these two expressions. One is a expression that gives the condition on the um, Floquet eigenenergy um, with respect to the eigen values of the original Hamiltonian, which I'm now calling R1 and R2. And you also get a condition then on the, basically I'm calling it the direction um, RF, but it, it's basically that gives you the full, uh, the full Floquet Hamiltonian. When you see this AX, AY, and AZ, um, are these expressions. And once you find the Floquet energy, you can then find AX, AY, and AZ. And so you can find the, you know, just fully analytically the uh, Floquet Hamiltonian for any mu. Um, so again, just going back and looking at this PT to PT modulation, uh, which corresponds to mu equals minus one. Um, by, look, by using the expressions from the last slide, we can look at different lines where, um, say, we have r1 tau equal to some multiple of pi. And that kind of gives us those ellipses, gives us these ellipse shapes, which are um, shown in white and blue. And that kind of lets us see uh, where these uh, resonances are, are going to, both at the um, low gamma case and as we increase gamma, we can see that they kind of all curl up to exactly the static, uh, the static PT uh, transition point. And uh, on the right, we can see that's when we're modulating between PT and Hermitian that those change. We only get the white ones. And also we can analyze the high gamma limit and see that the uh, PT unbroken phase extends all the way to infinity, but vanishingly small width 
uh, at the uh, at the previous resonance points, the which would have been the blue on the left hand side, but now they're the the red curves on the right hand side. So what's interesting about that particular case is you have resonances uh, for low gamma, which are PT uh, broken phase extending all the way down to vanishingly small uh, gain and loss parameter, but you also have PT unbroken phase extending all the way to infinity uh, for uh, extremely large gain and loss parameter. And you can find those exact lines by using these expressions. So now I'm going to go to the last part of my talk, which is just to discuss these topological systems. Um, so of course, um, just a brief review of the um, static of a static topological system. Um, I have the SSH model, which is just kind of the prototypical uh, example. Um, and in that case, you have this coupled dimer lattice with alternating couplings, uh, which I call V and W. So you, um, and this is all with no gain and loss or anything. This is just a Hermitian system. And uh, if you Fourier transform that system in K space, um, it has this simple, um, this simple uh, two-site Hamiltonian, and you can define a winding number, um, and you see that the winding number goes from one when the couplings, uh, when V is less than W, to zero when V is greater than W. And you have um, localization, um, which I show in the very left-hand side on the bottom. These are the uh, eigenstates with the amplitude of the eigenstates that varied over the spatial index. And you can see that you can have um, a state that is localized to the left, which is blue, and a state that's localized to the right, which is red. And this is all for uh, V less than W. So um, yeah. So this is just kind of the normal results from the static Hermitian SSH. But the point being that you have this nice winding number that you can define, which predicts the existence of the edge states. Um, and everything's Hermitian, so there's not uh, anything else to think about. But um, as has been studied a lot by a lot of different people, there's um, you can introduce gain and loss. <clears throat> so uh, we can vary gain and loss. Uh, so the first site is gain and the second site is loss and so on and so forth. Um, but keeping also the varying coupling strengths between the sites, V and W. And in that case, uh, there's also a PT breaking threshold. Uh, which you can find in k-space, uh, which I've shown the expression for that on the middle right-hand side. Um, and what you see is that the, the edge states, or what, what was the edge states for the SSH case, now correspond to exactly the um, broken eigenvalues of the PT Hamiltonian. So you still have these localized edge states, but they are uh, actually, if you look at these complex uh, space pictures, these are the com these are the top row of pictures here in the in here. Um, we're showing the energy eigenvalues, but over the complex plane, and you see those two uh, red dots that are in the imaginary part of the complex plane those actually correspond to the uh, localized states. So you do have localization, but it corresponds to the complex energies. So we know that the, the state that is on those localized states will experience the gain and loss like very harshly. 
And then as the gap closes, um, those states go away and then uh, you don't have the um, localized states. And so they're not in the complex part of the spectrum, which is the right to. And then you see uh, there's various ways to define topological numbers associated with the system, but none of them are, uh, they aren't um, quantized between zero and one. There's like an imaginary part and you have to use the left and right eigenvalues or eigenvectors to uh, define it. Um, so the question is always, can we find a nicer system where the uh, localized edge states also correspond to uh, real eigenvalues? So, okay, so this is just a uh, video of what's happening as we, uh, as we advance um, through the entire um, spectrum of varying the coupling parameter. So varying from uh, V is much less than W to V is much more than W. Um, we see that uh, when V is much less than, we have those edge states, but they're out in the complex uh, part of the graph. And then as this gap closes, then we get many states um, once we're in the PT broken phase, many states are in the complex part and they eventually extend all the way out and touch those edge states. And then everything comes back in, but the edge states disappear. And then the gap reopens and there are no more mid gap or no more protected edge states. So uh, we can think about this for the flow K case. Um, and actually, um, people have thought about this um, before. And um, actually, Use was one of the first people to uh, analyze a system like this, uh, where basically we can vary the gain and loss. Uh, in this case, we'll vary it the way that go where gain and loss are interchanged over one driving step. Um, so we can vary between. Uh, a Hamiltonian where the um, gain and loss are in one configuration, and then we can switch it, have, have a period just like I've been showing before, to gain and loss being the opposite, uh, completely flipped in space. And we can just think about the Hamiltonians that would describe that, and we can already see, if you look at these two um, at these two cases, uh, we can see that there will be when uh, V is very, uh, or when W is very small, there will be um, imaginary eigenvalues always in that Hamiltonian. And in the other Hamiltonian, if we, well, I guess if we, depending on what we switch to for the second Hamiltonian, we may or may not cancel out the imaginary eigenvalues that are on the edge of, or in the very extreme parts of the, of the Hamiltonian. So I guess what I've shown here is if you switch between gamma equals some value for half a period and gamma equals zero for the second half, then you can imagine that those, the I gamma, the red one in the upper left and the lower one in the lower right, won't cancel with the zero, which is occurs in the other, um, the other Hamiltonian. And this is just talking about the dimerized limit. So in that case, we kind of expect that there won't be, uh, there won't be a PT, a PT symmetric or there won't be a real eigenvalue associated with the uh, edge states. But if you imagine that we switch between plus and minus gamma, so that in the second step, we would have a minus gamma in the upper left and a plus gamma in the lower right, they actually would cancel out. So that kind of motivates uh, that type of modulation. 
which is switching the location of the gain and loss. So here I'm showing uh, a graph which, or a plot of the PT phase diagram for these systems, um, where I'm varying V, the coupling parameter, strength compared, uh, which this, as it's zero, it's fully dimerized on one side. And when it becomes one, it's fully, fully dimerized the other way. Um, and omega, which is the driving frequency is on the vertical axis. So with the type of driving where gamma goes to minus gamma over one period, uh, we get the picture on the left. And with the type of driving where gamma goes to zero, so driving between a PT symmetric system and a Hermitian system, we get the picture on the right. So again, the coloring in this graph is um, the maximum imaginary eigenvalue of that system. So everything on the left half of the graph for the PT to Hermitian, which is the right side, uh, is PT broken. And the left half of the graph, if you remember, uh, is where the topological phase should exist. So this is kind of showing that it's this system looks the same as the static PT SSH case versus the left side. When you drive between gamma and minus gamma, you don't have that because of this canceling effect of the gammas. Uh, so we're driving between just two different PT symmetric systems. So actually driving between two perfectly balanced PT symmetric systems uh, gives you a more stable picture than driving between a PT symmetric system and a Hermitian one, which maybe is a little surprising, but maybe not. Um, but basically on the left-hand side where it's in the black regions, you have a completely real eigenspectrum. So above a certain threshold, and I think this is what uh, you showed in the paper with the uh, sinusoidally varying Hamiltonian, you get uh, a fully uh, PT symmetric spectrum all the way across for all, uh, for all coupling parameterizations. So in that case, you can just, you can redefine the winding number and you can just see it vary from one to zero again. And actually anywhere that uh, there is a black region. So even below that high dri driving frequency at the top in the lower part, um, so for instance, on the left graph around omega equals J or omega over J is one, you see that there are actually still regions for a portion of uh, the coupling parameterization. So going horizontally across that graph, there are uh, large regions of PT symmetry, even below the high driving frequency. And um, those also, you can define uh, this winding number like that. So if you look at the spectrums of these systems, you actually see that the spectrum for the left-hand side is exactly the same as the static SSH, at least in the high driving frequency. And on the right-hand side for the high driving frequency, the spectrum is exactly the same as the PT SSH case. So uh, this is kind of maybe expected because uh, like I said, it's kind of like we're taking the average of these two Hamiltonians uh, in the high driving frequency. So I think the most interesting thing here is that there are regions uh, below the high driving frequency limit where we still have uh, a large region of PT symmetry and it being on the left-hand side means there is also a uh, topological state there. So if we look at the uh, complex spectrum again for these, uh, as we vary um, the coupling parameter from uh, V is much less than omega, or V is less, much less than W to V is uh, much larger than W. And the crossover point is at uh, this 0.5 in this parameterization. Um, we can see in the high driving frequency limit, which is the upper row of these graphs, uh, it looks exactly like a SSH spectrum. There's a mid gap state 
for um, for v less than omega or v less than w, and all the states, all the energies are real, and then that mid gap state is removed when the gap closes, and when it reopens, it's gone. And then if we move down to the uh, below the high driving frequency, which is the second row of panels, you can see the same thing. You have this mid gap state, which remains for uh, v less than 0 0.5 vt or v less than w. And as you increase it, though, you enter the PT broken phase uh, at some point. But the places where the energies uh, go into the complex spectrum is not on the mid gap state. It's actually on either side at the uh, other end, uh, on either side of these graphs. So the mid gap state actually remains all the way uh, until uh, V equals W and then it's removed. So you have actually a portion of, um, a portion of these pictures where you have all real eigenvalues below the high driving frequency limit and a mid gap state. And it doesn't remain as long, that situation doesn't remain as long as it does in the high driving frequency case because you do enter the PT broken phase, but the mid gap state uh, remains the whole time until V equals W and then it's removed. So I think, yeah, the, on this uh, Andrew, slide, yeah. Andrew, we, we have 10 past. You, you had a lot of questions, but we should watch a okay. little bit the time. Yeah, this is, I think, the last slide or maybe okay, second. Okay, slide. just just making you aware. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, so these two videos kind of show the, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the high driving frequency case um, where everything is real and it just looks like a, the video I showed for just the static PTSSH. And on the right-hand side, you have the uh, below the high driving frequency case where you still have a mid-gap state, um, but you do get a complex spectrum eventually, um, but it doesn't interfere with the uh, mid-gap state. And then that gets removed after V equals W or when the, cup, when the couplings are equal. So in conclusion, uh, I showed, I hope I showed that flow K modulation allows us to explore uh, PT breaking at very low gain and loss rates. So that was kind of that experiment with the, that I showed where we can have a very low gain and loss parameter compared to the coupling and still enter the PT broken phase. And uh, even for these uh, most, all of those were just these uh, two site systems. There's a very rich PT phase diagram and um, we can parameterize the different types of modulation and um, observe the limiting behavior of the resonance locations, both resonance and uh, the opposite of resonance where the uh, PT unbroken phase actually extends infinitely into the static PT broken phase. And finally, um, flow K modulation can be used to restore stability to topological systems. That was the last part of my talk. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, if there are any more questions, let me know. Thanks have, very much. I have a question. Um, when you were discussing this topological case, you identified a topological quantity. Mm -hmm. You said it was, was non-zero in V greater than W or zero in V less than W. Yeah. Was. Um, but that was derived for a Hermitian system. Yeah. So is that quantity modified in the PT case, or is do you still? Yeah. Is, is there some yeah. other some other function? Well, that's a good. Uh, that's kind of the whole study of this uh, whole thing is uh, when you derive the topological. I mean, the topological number for the static case uh, for the Hermitian case is just uh, you can take the Berry phase uh, as you go across uh, the, full, uh, the full range of Ks. And uh, in that case, it will be real. 
but uh, when you move to a non-Hermitian system, you have to use a different inner product as I think we were discussing before. So to maintain kind of the idea behind the very phase, you have to use the left eigenvalues. Well, one way is to use the left eigenvalues, or I mean left eigenvectors uh, to define your inner product. But then that doesn't guarantee that the um, berry phase will be real. So you have this complex berry phase in that case. And that's why uh, on that slide, when I showed uh, one particular um, winding number across that, there was an imaginary part that wasn't quantized between zero or one or anything like that. Well, I make a, a, could I ask a question that's sort of relevant to one of the things that Philip was asking about, I think, toward the beginning of your talk? Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, a, this is a, a very subtle question, the, the, the connection between um, broken and unbroken PT symmetry. Um, and the reason that it's subtle is that they are not just analytic continuations of one another. Uh, when you're in the PT uh, unbroken regime, you have a, a quant uh, you can set up a fully quantum mechanical system, mm -hmm. and you have, you know, you have an inner product and so on, and you are certainly uh, analytically continuing your Hamiltonian by varying parameters in that Hamiltonian. I mean, that looks like an analytic continuation, and in fact, you can track analytically what happens to the eigenvalues. However, the full quantum mechanical system does not analytically continue. Um, so for example, in the PT broken region, you end up with self orthogonal states. Yeah. Okay, so, so these, so, so things like inner products and so on do not analytically continue at all. So what yeah. you're doing is you're taking a, a Hamiltonian and pushing it back and forth between um, in, in a parameter that puts you either in the broken or the unbroken region, you're oscillating it back and forth. And then you're asking, you know, let's look at the spectrum and so on. And that's fine, but it's actually very hard for me to understand what is really going on here because um, you are, you're in, in some sense, I have to think about this, but in some sense, you're finessing the problem of analytically continuing between broken and unbroken regimes, okay? Um, you know, when you stick a Hamiltonian in a broken regime, you can then calculate the eigenvalues and those eigenvalues analytically continue. But the whole quantum system doesn't. So, you know, when you, when you just turn on a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, you can ask, let the eigenvalues fall into their places. But I'm not really clear about what is going on here physically. Um, well, I think you could take the view of, you know, um, maybe like a experimental system with like waveguides or something like that and where you're just analyzing um, a classical exactly. picture of the electric, exactly. electric field. That's right. So the, it is. So what you're saying makes sense in, in a way because the classical system does analytically continue just so long as yeah. you don't ask questions about things like, you know, definitions of inner products and so on. Right. As a classical system, there's no problem. Right. But at a, yeah, yeah. At the quantum level, um, you do, the, the systems are not analytic continuations of one another. And I don't really understand um, the connection between quantum mechanical systems with broken or unbroken PT symmetry. Okay, so you're sort of semi-quantum because you are yeah. talking about <laughs> eigenvalues and spectra but yeah. you're not really doing a fully quantum mechanical problem because, because there isn't any, I, I don't yet understand what is happening as you're varying the Hamiltonian, what happens with the inner product? You're in some sense averaging oh, yeah. over it. 
Well, and another important thing is, you know, when the inner product can disappear, um, right? And uh, then if, it, you know, when you're calculating, when you're trying to calculating a winding number or something, you have an inner product on in the denominator. Uh, basically, anytime you cross an exceptional point that causes a problem, right? So, uh, but even if you circle around an exceptional point to avoid that, you know, that difficult problem at the exceptional right. point, which I did still not still is really not an analytic continuation. Now, can, can I just right. paraphrase what Carla said? Um, the Hamiltonian continues to commute with PT as you go from one phase to the other, but the eigenstates stop being eigenstates of PT. Yeah. And that's, that's the discontinuity. Exactly, exactly. So it's really interesting. I mean, you can continue in some sense from one type of system to another type of system. But that continuation is not an analytic continuation. And so the relationship between the two becomes kind of fuzzy. I mean, it's a really interesting question. I would love to see this analyzed in, in greater depth because, because I really don't understand what it means to go from one system to another, but not in an analytical fashion where, where, it, where it, it, there involves, it involves jumps. Okay, which right. means you're making discrete choices as you perform the continuation, which is not analytical. If it were analytical, there wouldn't be any jumps. Right. So it, it's, it's sort of like you're jumping past a natural boundary or something like that. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Yeah, and I guess uh, you can take the, if you take the, uh, Floquet effective Hamiltonian as kind of the guide, uh, you have to, I see what you're saying that like, how does it become something that, you know, if the Floquet effective Hamiltonian looks, uh, you know, PT symmetric or not unbroken. Uh, yeah, I don't see what would break down in the calculation of that. But at the same time, uh, I see what you're saying about uh, there being this discontinuity as you cross over. Yeah, well, I, I mean, this is something that I, I think Andreas asked a question like this and Philip asked a question. I mean, there is this issue of, of, of when you have a time dependent Hamiltonian um, establishing a conventional quantum yeah. framework on that building a quantum framework on that Hamiltonian is, yeah. is fuzzy, it's difficult and it may be impossible. Yeah. And it, at, a, at a mathematical level that has to do with either being able to do or not being able to do an analytic continuation, which is interesting. I mean, you yeah. could do it in, in some sense, you can do it in the laboratory. And, yeah. and, and the theory- But with the open theory, system, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, in, but on the other hand, maybe theoretically it still remains fuzzy. Yeah, I think- um, Yeah, this, you see, there's one going thing- Going forward, that, oh, sorry. There's one thing you've constructed. You've talked about the evolution operator, the Floquet operator, but you haven't yeah. talked about the Hilbert space on which it acts. And you're looking at how the eigenvalues yeah. continue, which actually right. you can do, and that is analytic, but the Hilbert space on which the operator's ask, acting suddenly switches yeah. and there may not be um, there may not be a complex variable description of such an effect yeah i mean i i going forward from this think it would be interesting to look at uh because of the issues like what you guys are saying um looking at it from a point of view of the quantum mechanical open system and trying to see what can be done, you know, from a master equation point of view, I think. But I don't know. I don't know what uh, the results would look like if this same effect would happen or not. 
More questions, Frida and then Julio. Carl, as long as, as he looks at the Floquet theorem, it's simply a mathematical problem of looking at integrals uh, uh, of matrices. At that level, you are, do not introduce quantum mechanics and any uh, kind of inner products. So uh, like in elliptic functions, when you are on a torus, it depends how you uh, take your integrations, whatever you get, and uh, you have somehow uh, different solutions. And here you do not look only at the eigenvalues of these integrals, but you also look at the time dependent uh, eigenvectors, which are somehow part of your integrals. So at that level, you do not need to talk about any metric. Yeah? So you just look uh, mathematically at an integral, which, which somehow goes uh, over time dependent matrices. Of course, when you're then later related to some physics, uh, then you have to talk about how these uh, uh, inner products uh, develop and how to make quantum mechanics out of it. But at, at that level, he discussed it, it was simply a mathematical issue. This is precisely what I said. Julio. Okay, yes, I wanted to make a comment that in Floquet theory, uh, you are splitting your, your evolution operator that you call G of T as P of T, which describes the uh, inter period, uh, inside the period of uh, evolution. And uh, the other, which was the, the Floquet, is just simply a, a constant evolution in, uh, with Floquet Hamiltonian. So yeah. if you focus only on the Floquet Hamiltonian, you are making such a, as a stroboscopic description. So you take a picture every T, every a time T, you take yeah. pictures, so you see the, the system in a constant like in a constant state, but maybe this this provides uh, just a, well as you said as you said an average description, but maybe you should also study the evolution by p p of t p of t to have a complete view of a... yeah to get the complete view you need p of t, but p of t will not contribute anything that's not periodic. So P of T helps you uh, see the full description of the evolution, but it's uh, it's in some sense um, bounded. Yes, but with with G of uh, with G, uh, with the Floquet Hamiltonian with G of capital T, you are only taking a picture every T at time T. So I mean, it's like a stroboscopic description. You you don't see yeah. what is happening. This oscillation that will be provided by P of T, uh, right. uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, you should uh, study what happens, but uh, probably the, the picture could change very much in, in between. I don't know if, yeah, have, I mean, if, if we have tried to to, uh, to bound the, the, the change in, this, in the in the description, we use uh, also P of T. Well, so to me, P of T is something that can tell you more about the time evolution at all times. But if you're looking at the long time evolution, uh, the important thing is the factor of the Floquet Hamiltonian. Yes, because whatever yeah. happens in that time is not going, like if, if I'm looking at, uh, the behavior I'm looking for is, do we see exponentially increasing uh, eigenvalue or exponentially increasing, you know, probabilities or something like that over time? Uh, P of T is not going to contribute to the long-term behavior. Because it's just bounded. It's just a periodic operator. So whatever it does contribute, it has to return to the identity at the stroboscopic times. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's how I would look at it. Now you need P of T to uh, calculate the full description, that's true. But I guess everything I've been calculating here is just trying to look at, I'm defining uh, 
the behavior that I want to look at as the behavior of the Floquet Hamiltonian or the behavior that's uh, induced by the Floquet Hamiltonian. But I think even, even though if P of t go, is zero every at the stroboscopic, stroboscopic times, uh, is zero, so it's the entity at the stroboscopic, stroboscopic times, the state of the system cannot, does not return to the same state. So we have these very phases, or you can right. have this, uh, I mean, you can have exponential evolution in this case, if P of t is, is PT or no emission. So, so I think that, the the effect of P of T can be non-bounded. I guess I suppose because I'm not uh, I haven't, I haven't made a... in the case of an emission Hamiltonian of, of course its contour is bound bounded but in the case of a non-emission Hamiltonian maybe you can have uh, some unbounding effects. Well I guess I mean like at yeah I mean I'm thinking about like if I take some initial state and evolve it for like a thousand periods, I still will be able to tell you what's happened, roughly what's happened by just looking at the Floquet operator because it still has to coincide with that, right? At the stroboscopic times. Like I don't even need the information contained in P anytime that P is equal to the identity, right? So I, it's sort of like, yeah, maybe something's happening in between those times, but it has to match up at the stroboscopic times. But you of course need P to calculate, you know, things like all the um, collection of, um, like we were talking about the collection of the eigenstates because P basically uh, P still contributes to the evolution and the analysis of the problem. But if you're just talking about the eigenvalues and what is the long-term behavior. Um, but, but have you checked if P of T is, provides a unitary evolution or P of, of PT, P of T is uh, correspond to some uh, PT or non emission Hamiltonian? No, I don't think it's, <clears throat> I think it's just that at the stroboscopic times, the P has to be equal to the identity. So uh, basically G of uh, any stroboscopic time is just dependent on this Floquet Hamiltonian. Oh, oh, okay. But I, I do agree that, I mean, to get the full evolution, like in, these kind of pictures, you need the P. And that's why P is what causes uh, some of this uh, behavior along the, um, like if you look at these, I don't know if you guys can still see what I'm showing, but mm -hmm. um, the time evolution here, uh, while it's periodic, there's some other behavior going on too in between the period. Mm -hmm. But it has to return to the PT case at every stroboscopically mm -hmm. relevant time. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So that's ex actually also in the broken case, the same thing. So in the, in the red plot, uh, over time, it's exponentially increasing, but there's some other behavior too, like this kind of stair-stepping thing. Mm. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Now I see it. Okay. And yeah, same thing, I guess, on the right-hand side. I didn't mention this on this page, but the, again, the right-hand side is the time evolution uh, of various um, PT broken uh, conditions. And you can see on the very bottom graph, on the very bottom right, uh, there's oscillatory behavior when the, in the blue dots, which correspond to the system actually being in the, uh, this is with J turned on, this is when J is varying, the coupling is varying. So when the coupling's turned on, you have these oscillations, but they're bounded oscillations. And then when it's turned off, the system grows exponentially, and then it's turned back on and you have the oscillations again, uh, and so on and so forth. But the long-term behavior, if you look at the very top graph, 
of this panel on the right, you can start to see this uh, exponentially increasing behavior. And the, the scale here is logarithmic. These graphs, they look like integrals over a series of delta functions. <laughs> huh. Well, I guess. And this makes you the makes share sense, right? in delta functions you find very uh, much in Fur uh, Fury's Fourier theory. No? Yeah. What, what happens if there is not a delta function? but you have some holes somewhere uh, in the vicinity of the real axis, then they are somehow smoothed out and it depends whether the poles show up positive or positive and negative, what okay. you will see on the real axis. So I would recommend you to make a Fourier analysis of this. Yeah, that's, inter that's interesting. Um, and I think maybe if the, uh, coupling wasn't uh, discrete like that, that obviously will change the, the shape too. Any more questions? Should we then thank Andrew again for the really nice talk? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.